Actually, I'm very hopeful we'll have a, an interesting conversation here. I think you know you seem to suddenly be everywhere on the internet, and and you've been on many other podcasts. And I think we should talk briefly about the reasons why you've suddenly become so visible. But I don't think we should spend a lot of time on them because I think that's territory where you and I will almost fully converge. And I think that's not what people are most interested in in having us talk about. But to just get people up to speed with what's been happening with you and why you've been so visible all of a sudden. Let's talk briefly about the free speech issues, the gender pronoun issues, what's happening in Canada around this bill, C-16, and the, and the gender provision and the Ontario Human Rights Code. Just bring us up to speed there. And I, again, I think we should spend probably no more than 10 minutes or so there, and then we'll move on to areas where you and I may not fully agree. 10 minutes would be plenty, yeah. yeah. Um, Canada moved at the federal level, level to institute some legislation that on the surface of it seems more or less in keeping with the extension of human rights protection to different groups uh, that's been occurring, say, over the last 30 to 50 years. Um, this time they extended protection to gender identity and gender expression. Um, the first problem with that, although by no means the worst problem, is that gender expression is not a group. And as far as I can tell from reading the Ontario Human Rights Commission website policies, which the federal government announced they, that the provisions of Bill C-16 would be interpreted within, it's now, you can now pro provisionally be prosecuted under the hate crime uh, hate crime legislation federally for criticizing someone's choice of fashion. And I'm not being cynical about that. Um, that's the Ontario Human Rights Commission policies describe gender expression as the manner in which people present themselves through such while well doing everyday activities like shopping through their choice of clothes and dress. And the idea that that requires protection of that magnitude, well, I think it's, I think it's, if you keep extending rights, all you do is weaken them. You know, you, it, rights are some one person's rights or another person's responsibilities and anyways that's not the worst of it the worst of it is that the code the ontario provisions which are like lurking behind the federal law and are already law in ontario require the use of these so-called preferred pronouns if someone requests them and i have a variety of objections to that the most fundamental of which is I believe that the manufactured pronouns, the Z and the Zer and the 50 sort of variants of those are... Just for a moment, describe yeah. what you're referring to there, because I, I think even among my audience, this is an arcane topic. What are these manufactured pronouns? Well, there, it's dogma, I would say, among the radical left that gender is a social construct and that there are multiple variants of gender gender identity, and some of those don't fit neatly into male-female classifications. The legislation says that people can inhabit any position on that spectrum or, or not be on the spectrum at all between male and female, which, of course, I find that particular claim essentially incomprehensible. Um, anyways, the theory is, is that People who are non-binary, which is the terminology, are entitled to be referred to by pronouns other than he or she, hmm. which include they, which would, I suppose, be the most moderate compromise, and then a host of other pronouns that have appeared basically out of the void over the last 10 years, including words like Z and Zer and Her, which would be H-I-R, and hmm. Zem. And there's a, there's a truly there's like 70 different sets of them right and there's no um, agreement whatsoever on which ones should be used and none of them have entered popular parlance because they are bad solutions to the problem and the legislation nonetheless necessitates their use and this is the first time that Canadian government has moved to make a particular kind of speech content mandatory you know there are certain limitations on speech, although not very many of them. But this is the first time out of the commercial realm that the actual contents of speech have been made um, mandatory. And my particular objection to this is that 
I believe, and I think I have good evidence for believing that these made up pronouns, these manufactured pronouns are part of the lexicon of the radical postmodern slash neo-Marxist left. And it's part of their general agenda to occupy the linguistic territory that we use for common parlance. And I don't like their philosophy. In fact, I regard it as reprehensible, to say the least. And because of that, I'm not willing to cede linguistic territory to them, certainly not by being forced to use ideologically um, would saturate it as an ideologically saturated lexicon. Mm. And so I said I wouldn't do it. I made a video, um, three videos actually, complaining about, you know, let's say criticizing Bill C-16 in the background legislation, which also, by the way, makes employers responsible for any word that their employees utter that causes anyone any offense, intended or unintended, whether or not the employer knows that that utterance occurred, which seems to me a little bit on the draconian side, but I think is in keeping with the same philosophy, which is by no means pro-business. Um, and there are other elements of mm. what's going on in the background that are equally reprehensible. Toronto, Canada, Ontario has set up social justice tribunals. That's their technical name, which gives you some insight into their purpose. and and into their staffing. One of those is the Ontario Human Rights Commission, and they basically decided that they have the right to suspend normal legal normal legal and judicial procedure, and that they can more or less ascribe to themselves whatever rights they, whatever powers they choose, and that's written in their policy statements. And so I'm not very happy about any of that. And so also at the same time, the University of Toronto made it mandatory for their human resources employees to undergo unconscious bias training against racism, which is also something, again, that I don't, I don't believe the science for documenting unconscious bias is anywhere near advanced to the point where it should be used as a diagnostic indicator of the potential prejudice of, an, of entire classes of people. Um, I, uh, and, and, I don't think there's any question that the, the tool is too weak to do that, certainly by the standards of appropriate psychometric tests. And there's certainly no evidence that these training programs that are popping up anywhere do any good with regards to prejudice and a fair bit that they actually make it worse. Right. So anyways, I made two videos, posted them on my YouTube channel. Um, mostly I did it fairly late at night and I was just trying to think this stuff through, you know, to get a, get it straight in my head and to, and, and and to lay out the argument and well the response to them was absolutely insane really mm. uh, um there's 180 separate newspapers articles written and two protests at the university of toronto and i received two warning letters from the administration and uh, a letter of censure from a number of my fellow academics and postdocs and graduate students at the university of toronto and it was it was news literally well to, yesterday the toronto star published like a 3000 word biography of me and toronto life which is i suppose our equivalent to new yorker although not in the same league is going to publish a 5000 word bio on me and um well and then i've talked to joe rogan and a whole bunch of other people mm. for podcast it's been crazy it's it's yeah. but the reason for that is because I made something that was bubbling underneath the surface of our culture um, and was certainly bubbling under the surface of yours at the last election. I made it concrete and put forth my objections in an articulate manner, and it struck a chord with people. And, and it's actually been news not only in Canada, but it stretched its tentacles down to the States and, and certainly into West, you know, the West, Western Europe and Australia and New Zealand. And, I'm being interviewed in South Africa this week, and it's been absolutely, it's been like being in a ship in a storm, and I, yeah. and it's, it's dumbfounding. I can imagine it's been 
It's been stressful, I'm sure. Now, is, is your job at the University of Toronto in jeopardy? Is that the kind of communication you've received? or? Well, I received two warning letters basically asking me to stop talking about this based on the idea that even talk, even mentioning the fact that I might not use these pronouns probably contravened the Ontario Human Rights Code and also the University Code of Conduct, although hypothetically the University's Code of Conduct is dominated by protection for free speech. And so they kind of did the typical HR thing and got the lawyers on it, and they're conservative. And, you know, they warned me twice. Um, I didn't stop talking about it, but then the university was roundly criticized by a number of Canada's major journalists, including a coalition of 100 newspapers. And uh, they got a lot of bad press. Uh, the press actually turned in support of me quite hard about two weeks after this started when they started to investigate what I was talking about and found out that I actually knew what I was, knew what I was, that my claims weren't um, exaggerated by any stretch of the imagination. Mm. And so I've seen that criticism. I, I've paid attention to what you've been saying on this topic. And some people have said that you are at least mistaken about the the legal implications of these changes in the law or these rulings. But it seems to me you the one thing you can't be mistaken about is the treatment you have received thus far in response to your saying you won't use these pronouns. If the university lawyers hadn't been convinced that I was correct in my interpretation, they wouldn't have sent out a warning that I should stop doing it because it might be illegal. Hmm. That's the best piece of proof supporting my my position that the law has this draconian element because, you know, they didn't send me those letters incautiously. They had their lawyers review the damn legislation and then came to the same conclusion that I did. Right. And so, and the two lawyers who have been making these claims that this legislation is far more innocuous than I'm making it out to be are both social activist lawyers. And mm. so they have a, they have a serious agenda. And one of them, Brenda Cosman, told me, well, that I wouldn't go to jail, although that is a possibility, despite what she said, because the, the law does have that power. All that would happen is that, essentially, I could be financially ruined. It's like, right. well, okay, right. well, that's not draconian at all, you know, I mean. Yeah. So, yeah. And, the, and the Ontario Human Rights Commission has managed to demolish lots of people's lives. It's a, it's a kangaroo court, in my opinion, and, and a very dangerous one at that. One thing we absolutely agree about is that freedom of speech is not just one among many different values. It re really is the master value because it's the only corrective to human stupidity. It's the only mechanism by which we can improve our society. And in fact, it's, it's the value that allows us to improve our other values through conversation. Yes, that's exactly right. It's the fundamental value. It's exactly right. It's the fundamental value upon which our entire cultural edifice is predicated. And I believe that that's part of the reason why the postmodern radicals in particular um, are opposed to freedom of speech, because they don't really, they don't believe in dialogue. You know, they don't believe in rationality. They don't believe that groups who have different orientations of power can discuss their um, differences in a civilized manner and reach resolution, uh, because that isn't how they see the world. That's how modernists see the world, but postmodernists don't believe any of that, and they seriously don't believe it. It's no, it's not a facade or a, it's 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 a very entrenched part of their their philosophy. Mm. So that's partly why they don't like to, well, why they block speakers who oppose their views from campus, and why they're perfectly willing to shut them down, and why they don't, you know, why they have a, no platforming policies, which is basically the decision not to let anyone who holds alternative views have a forum even, you know, and it's because, well, it's because they don't believe in, in rational dialogue and the possibility of reaching a solution through it. There's something, at least on its face, so wrongheaded about this pronoun campaign that it makes me feel like I don't understand something about it. Well, you don't. There's, 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 there's something more nefarious lurking at the bottom of it. And you see, in Canada, you know, I know that you're not a social constructionist. I know that you, like Steven Pinker, believe deeply that human behavior is profoundly influenced by its underlying biological substrate, which is another view that we share. But 
Canada has now written a social constructionist view of human identity into the law. So it's illegal. It's legally, uh, it's, it's illegal, at least in principle, to claim that biology has anything to do with gender identity or that right. biology and gender identity have anything to do with gender expression or that any of those three have anything to do with social orientation in a causal manner. Right. And that's written into the law. So what the social justice warriors are going to do next is to go after the biologists. And, you know, they did that with E.O. Wilson already back, you know, 30 years ago. And they're doing it in Germany uh, right now. But and there's an anti-psychiatry scholarship established at the Ontario Institute for the Study of Education, which is a particularly pernicious institution. And and it's no longer obvious what sort of claims you can make as a scientist about the relationship between biology and and sex or the hypothetically separate gender identity. Right. So right. that's the worst of the lot, you know, because normally governments shy away from implementing a particular ideology, especially one that's discredited, which certainly the radical social constructionist position is to make to to impl to you know make that a fundamental part of the law and that's definitely happened and that'll unfold in a particularly nasty way over the next 10 years ideology aside there's just a, a difference between a positive and negative injunction so you know, i can ask you to stop doing an infinite number of things and that imposes no energy cost on you i can say stop using the n word it offends me right or stop littering or stop driving your car on the sidewalk, right? And you can not do those things, and it takes no time not to do those things. It takes no cognitive overhead not to do those things. But I can't ask you to do an infinite number of things. I can't tell you to pick up all the litter you see everywhere, because you'd spend the rest of your life doing that, and you, would, you still would fail to comply with the injunction. And asking people to learn a new list of gender pronouns and then live in a state of vigilance to see that they apply them correctly. This is a positive injunction, and you're, you're, you're demanding that people do something. For me to demand that people start using a word of my own invention, or if I say, I want to be addressed by a 16-digit number, and I'm going to be offended if you get the number wrong, this is imposing a cost on people. I'm going to be offended, and I'm going to take you to court, and you could be charged under hate speech, and I could change that pronoun in an hour if I want, or tomorrow or the next day on a whim. Because that's also part of the legislation, because that covers the people who are so-called gender fluid. And so they have the right to transform their identity according to their subjective whim, I would say. Because the other legislation also assumes that... Huh, this identity that's being protected so hard has no grounding in biology, and it's only subjectively determined. So they actually go beyond social constructionism to make it essentially solipsistic. It's hmm. the only thing that determines your identity is the way that you feel at that time. So that's and that's an unbelievably poverty-stricken notion of identity, which at minimum is something that you have to negotiate with other people. I mean, it has to be functional, yeah. and you have to negotiate it with other people. So, well, you can, it's not understandable unless you look underneath it. And that's why I was objecting, because I think it's a perfectly reasonable manifestation of the postmodernism that's nested in neo-Marxism. It's perfectly in keeping with their stated aims. So, and those aims are not, if you are an admirer of Western culture, at least the good parts of Western culture, then you're the enemy of the postmodern slash neo-Marxists. Mm. They, they're opposed to absolutely everything you believe. We're going to get into that territory, I, I would imagine, by another route. So I don't think there's more to say here, because I think we probably agree about everything. I'm obviously not a lawyer. I'm certainly not a Canadian lawyer. So if there's any way in which we're getting some of the legal details wrong, I offer a blanket apology. But, it, but in terms of the belief that biology doesn't significantly determine gender or sexuality or the wisdom and utility of 
inventing new identities and demanding that everyone keep track of them in perpetuity. I mean, I think you and I more or less totally overlap there. So I think we should just move on. No, you, better not, you better not come to Canada and have that discussion yeah. then. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just, it's been bizarre to see some of these encounters you've been having, but it's, this is why you're, you've, you've suddenly become so visible to people. And it's, it's very interesting to, to see that this is how it's manifesting. But we, we have 